Hello and welcome to Politics Today. In this program today we'll be discussing the row uh, that is dominating the Labour Party and the news headlines now for what appears to be weeks and that is the issue of anti-Semitism within the Parliamentary Labour Party and to discuss this very important issue I'm joined by uh, Michael McCann, uh, Director of Israel Britain Alliance and former Labour MP and also Sharon Claff from the Campaign of, of Truth. So welcome to the programme. Uh, Michael, we, uh, ever since uh, Jeremy Corbyn became leader of the uh, Labour Party and the Labour movement, uh, we've been discussing this issue because the issue of anti-Semitism, or as I prefer to call it, uh, Jew hatred, uh, is an issue that hasn't gone away. Um, why is it that the issue of Jew hatred and um, the alignment of Israel and, uh, and almost the total disregard for the Jewish community um, has not gone away since he's become leader of the Labour Party. That's actually escalated. Well, in truth, anti-Semitism has been hiding in plain sight in the Labour Party for, for years. Uh, you know, you've got to understand Jeremy Corbyn's politics, which is extreme left-wing politics. So we had a period where uh, the party was completely out of kilter with the, the British public's opinions and on general po political issues. When you move through uh, a period when you had Michael Foote as leader, then Neil Kinnock. And then Neil Kinnock took the party some way in terms of the uh, uh, modernisation process. Then you had the short period of John Smith before he, he passed away. And then you had uh, a completely modernist outlook from uh, Tony Blair. Uh, and then Gordon Brown. Uh, and then you moved into a, an era where you had uh, Ed Miliband really, um, without putting too fine a point, being pretty rudderless and going nowhere. Um, so the situation is that Jeremy Corbyn has been present throughout the period when these leaders were in place, you know, as a, as a point within the Labour Party. Uh, many of the hard left elements of the party were, were flung out, including people like Dave Nellis and Terry Fields in 1992. But they treated Jeremy Corbyn as like an old hippie type of character, someone who you know wore the sandals and the uh, and the uh, the poncho and that, that type of thing. Uh, but it wasn't a serious threat. But that's when they made a huge mistake, and when they allowed people like John McDonnell to stay in the party as well, because these people never changed their beliefs. Their their anti-Semitism is camouflaged, covered up by this and this deep-rooted hatred for Israel. That's where it comes from. Uh, and and in, in the inside Jeremy Corbyn's head, he differentiates between his hatred for Israel and, his, his, and saying that he can be, um, he doesn't hate Jewish people and he, therefore he's never been racist, there's not a racist bone in his body. Uh, on the contrary, if you look at his actions, they give it all away. Uh, so in terms of the, your, the answer to your direct question, it has always been there it was diluted and it was it was hidden away and it was it was in small amounts when uh, we had a sensible leadership within the Labour Party with um, Tony Blair uh, and Gordon Brown, as particularly when they were prime ministers. Uh, but it's always been there, and so therefore, when Jeremy Corbyn became leader, not only did Ed Miliband's policy of a three pound membership fee, which allowed you to vote for the leader, create the carnage which allowed uh, Jeremy Corbyn uh, to be to break through and become the leader, but all of those people who held all those views, those extreme views, are now in control. And so therefore, it's no surprise that from those humble beginnings when they were, uh, you know, they were seen as an extreme faction within the Labour Party, but they were still tolerated, that now we can rue the day that we allowed that to happen because now they're in charge of the Labour Party. And all of the people who believe the same things as Jeremy Corbyn uh, are, they are his cheer cheerleaders. That's how you get the ridiculous situation where a report to that was by uh, Chakrabarti, which was designed uh, to deal with anti-Semitism, you have a guy in the audience saying that there's a, an anti-Semitic trope actually making an accusation against a Jewish Labour MP that was sitting in the audience. And what does Jeremy Corbyn do? Jeremy Corbyn doesn't condemn him. He goes up after the meeting takes place, shakes his hand mm. and thanks him for, his do for doing his dirty work. That's the Labour Party in 2018. It's heartbreaking. Absolutely. And um, Sharon, how, how do you feel uh, being Jewish and also um, part of your uh, organisation, which is called uh, Campaign for Truth, and you very much focused on issues relating to anti-Semitism, to know that someone like uh, Jeremy Corbyn came very close to, in uh, last year's general election to actually having the keys to Downing Street and taking power? 
Um, thank you for inviting me, Simon. Always a pleasure. Um, I, I am convinced that Jeremy Corbyn is probably the most dangerous man in the UK at this moment. Um, and he's dangerous because he's got supporters who are three generations away from the Holocaust. The Holocaust is meaningless to them. It's like me studying Napoleonic history. Um, it was something in a history book. Um, and I, I know quite a lot of young people that teach them. And they are totally unconcerned about anti-Semitism. When I tell them that Corbyn is an anti-Semite for the reasons that Michael explained, um, they just smile at me. They, they have absolutely no concept of what it means to be an anti-Semite. Um, as a Jew, um, I, I think this year, for the first time, I've understood what happened in Europe in 1933 when Hitler was elected. And let's not forget he was elected. He was the outsider. He was a bit like Corbyn, a bit of an activist. He had a, a hobby horse. Corbyn's got his Marx, Marxist hobby, hobby horse, his extreme left-wing tribunite hobby horse. Um, and he's an activist. He should not be a politician. He should not be a leader of any country. Um, and if the people of this country think it's just the Jews that are aimed at, they have to know that if Corbyn runs this country, he'll run the economy into the ground, um, and he's going to run our country into the ground. If he denuclearizes uh, unilaterally, which is what he says he's going to do, he's going to put us in extreme danger. Coupled with that, his support for terrorist organizations and he brushes off the idea that he calls them his friends. They are his friends. Um, we've been following him for many years. He's been mixing with those people. He supports those people, even now, with the land mass that's going on, the land march on, his, in, on Israel. He has not stood up for one thing that's happening, and not the pollution caused by the tires, not the Pallywood um, uh, productions they're making, not the children they're bringing there. He stood up for nothing. So he's dangerous. And um, Michael, uh, how will ordinary uh, members of the uh, Labour Party or members of Parliament uh, feeling, because obviously the majority of them uh, don't actually like Jeremy Corbyn very much, as we've seen that he's had uh, two leadership contests uh, prior to last year's uh, general election to maintain his position as leader of the Labour Party. Um, and how is this row and his failure to tackle this growing problem of anti-Semitism uh, causing for ordinary MPs that are decent, who support Israel and support the Jewish community? Uh, well, it's really difficult for them because uh, there's a great book that's just come out recently by a, a good friend of mine, Tom Harris, who's written a book called Ten, Ten Years and the Death of the Labour Party. And um, um, not to give him a plug, but I read his book in a, in a, in a recent train journey. I did it, in, did it in one sitting. And he explains the story of, explains the narrative of what changed. And, and effectively what happened is because Ed Miliband introduced this three pounds uh, joining policy, then all the people who held the views that were extreme and were part of militant in the 1980s, who'd been kicked out of the Labour Party, they all come back in. It just wasn't the young ones that came back in and this concept that, you know, that, that, that the idea that this is somehow Corbynism and the politics associated with them is, are new. They're not new. I've been through it and defeated them before. Uh, in the, when I was a young man growing up in the, uh, in the, the Labour and Trade Union movement. So therefore, but he's also brought in the people who were extremists back then, the older people, They've all come back into the party as well. So in terms of the, the people, who, if you look at the, the real uh, failing points within the Labour Party, the nominations process by people like um, uh, Sadiq Khan, uh, David Lammy, ironically now being targeted by momentum in his own constituency, uh, and others who nominated Jeremy Corbyn, despite the fact that they didn't believe in his politics, allowed them on the ballot paper and made the crucial misjudgment that didn't realise that all these people that are now joining, and indeed others, who joined for a bit of political fun. I know Conservatives who joined the Labour Party and voted in the leadership contest to elect Jeremy Corbyn for a laugh. It isn't a laugh yeah. now, uh, after the result in 2017. So in terms of those politics and, and, and them now coming to the fore, is that he has got a team around him and it's almost cult-like. It's not like a leader of a political party. That, that's Jeremy Corbyn faction, which is all these youngsters who are somehow beguiled by this old man. Uh, who has got this wild set of politics that they, so, they somehow think it's going to lead them to a nirvana. In terms of, if his politics are bad enough, you know, in terms of uh, his economic policies and all the rest of it, let, but let's put them to the one side. The situation that he supports Hamas and calls them his friends, Hezbollah calls them his fr their friends, that during this whole anti-Semitism 
issue that's going on and just will refuses to go away. At at that time, who does he condemn? Who does he who does he decide to interrupt his Easter holiday for? A condemnation of Israel defending their borders. But listen, we shouldn't be surprised. The guy that Jihadi John that, that cut off people's uh, heads, uh, you know, on videos, he thought that guy should have been brought back to trial. So is it as if the, the, the British police were going to fly into sort of like a uh, territory owned or controlled by uh, so-called Islamic State and we're going to hoist this guy out in some way in order to bring him back to trial? That is a madness of Corbyn. It's completely and utterly detached from the reality and the challenges that we face in 2018. And it's, and what's really at the kernel of it all is this hatred, not only for the West, but hatred for people who are involved in the system. And he follows that old, uh, you know, anti-Semitic trope about uh, Jewish people being linked to the financial industry and, and being controlled of the press and media, something that's a complete and utter fallacy. Uh, and, and he mobilises that hatred within the group that support him. It's a really worrying time. Let's have a look now at uh, a new emerging spokesman on behalf of the uh, Jewish uh, community. And uh, this is Maureen Lippmann demonstrating outside with many Jewish people outside the headquarters of the Labour Party. Said Corbyn made me a Tory. Corbyn made me a Tory. Everything you've heard, I'm going to be brief because uh, it's gone on, but everything you've heard today points to the fact that we have an anti-Semite as the head of the British Labour Party. Thank you, Maureen. That is what we have, and that is what he is doing by standing with elements that are against everything we stand for. Hard-working, hard-working, decent Jewish people of whom I am incredibly proud. Who've allowed... Yeah, yeah, and... and uh, Going to the Seder night was the absolute cherry on the top of Jeremy's behaviour. Yeah. On the wrong night. Yeah. With the wrong people. Yeah. Behaving as we have now come to expect him to behave. By doing nothing, he is telling us the same thing as he's been telling us for 30 years. He wants a Marxist party because it's worked so well in the rest of the world. I think you're all incredibly brave for risking frizzy hair to come here today. Or his crime is of not looking at not the poster, you, of not realizing not what the website said that he subscribed to for over two years. Is he, as Monty Python might have said, just a very naughty boy? Does his reading of Elijah's prayer re-envisaged as fill this cup with the hope that socialism and revolution will be upon us soon correlate with his failure to notice the cartoon that it outgrossed the work of Grossman or not to observe when he logged on the website and that some of the contributors spoke about Jews in a manner contradictory to the lifelong, lifelong opposition to racism. I'm a big fan of uh, Maureen Littman doing a great job in standing up for the Jewish community. Um, what is your response, um, Sharon, uh, to, uh, to the Jewish community's uh, reaction? Because uh, we've seen a recent demonstration organised by the Board Deputies, the Jewish Leadership Council outside um, Parliament, uh, protesting at Jeremy Corbyn's failure to address the issue of uh, anti-Semitism within his party, and uh, particularly this uh, picture uh, that, he po that he commented on Facebook, which shows uh, uh, this portrayal of uh, so-called Jewish bankers controlling monopoly board of, of the oppressed people, which stems of those old, hated uh, protocols, the elders of Zion, uh, and what have you, that the Jews control the world and the media. Um, and the only answer to that, if they did, why is Israel against such bad media coverage? Exactly. If we do control everything, we're doing a pretty bad job of it, I think. Um, what is my reaction to the Jewish community's uh, recent actions? Um, I think it's about time that they actually did something like this. After all, that mural was on the wall six years ago, and those of us who were activists on the street knew about it, um, and we were unable to stir anybody to actually pay attention to it. 
um, even though it was taken down, the Jewish community didn't really react to it. So thank goodness, finally, um, they got their engines going and they've done something. However, when I look at what happened at Parliament Square, I see it as a platform that was provided for the Labour Party. It was a great electioneering platform for MPs to come along there as though they were in Blackpool, taking some selfies, saying I was there, uh, making speeches, telling everybody to join. One of them, I can't remember who, said, invited people to join the Labour Party because only by joining the Labour Party can you defeat Jeremy Corbyn. Um, this is not really what I feel we should be doing. We should really be highlighting the dangers of this extreme racism in our country. Um, you'll be surprised to know that I'm not a great fan of a definition of anti-Semitism either. Um, I think when you define something, an emotion like that, and it is an emotion. When you define it, you give people a reason to get out of um, saying that, out of being anti-Semitic. Um, they have a get out clause. So I don't think you can define it. And uh, we see in the CPS uses it a lot in refusing to prosecute cases that they should be uh, uh, prosecuting. So yeah, um, I'm pleased that the Jewish community is doing something. I am quite impressed about some of the speeches that took place on this last Sunday outside Labour headquarters. I think there were some very important messages that came across. And I'm hoping that politicians are listening. I'm hoping the journalists are picking up on more than Maureen, because Maureen is great, she's a great voice, but there were people there speaking about the real problems that can be tackled. Um, and I'm hoping that will come through to the politicians. Absolutely. Uh, and Michael, the reason why this is such a serious subject is that we know that wherever we see a rise of Jew hatred emerge in society, not only does it firstly uh, uh, attack the uh, Jewish people first, but it also sowed the seeds for our own destruction. So the prospect of someone like uh, Jeremy Corbyn becoming Prime Minister with those who hold uh, violent and dangerous anti-Semitic views does not pose well for our society. Um, can you spell out to us the dangers of, of the Labour Party not confronting this issue of uh, due hatred within the, uh, within the party? Well, I think it was really interesting that uh, what people often see as a, as a left of centre publication in the Guardian Observer newspaper printed a poll at the weekend which said that 51% of people felt that the Labour Party was anti-Semitic. I think that's a start, uh, simply because I, I just think a lot of people don't get anti-Semitism because they don't connect it with the word racism. Everybody understands what racism is uh, and, you know, it, you know, in the 60s and 70s, we used to have programmes like Love Thy Neighbour, which would now be considered overtly racist because of the things that were said in them. Our society has changed. But there's one element of it, treating Jewish people differently uh, because of their backgrounds and their history, and, uh, is, has not, or has been on the periphery of all these issues. But I don't want to depress anybody unnecessarily. Uh, and I don't think, and I follow Sharon's logic, that uh, the demonstration in Parliament Square it uh, wasn't an opportunity for politicians to say, join our party. Because I think if I was one of those people, I'd be saying, well, hold on a second, you've created this whole mess. Mm. Your colleagues actually broke your own Labour Party rules and procedures, which means that the nomination process has got a, a percentage number of MPs that are required to nominate someone to get on the ballot paper for a reason. The reason is that the, whoever wins must have support within the parliamentary Labour Party from their colleagues. So therefore, if you put someone on the ballot paper just to let them have their views aired, that's a breach of the reason that the rules were created in the first place. Mm -hmm. So when David Lamy um, and uh, Sadiq Khan and Margaret Beckett and others nominated Jeremy Corbyn without, with have, having no desire whatsoever to vote for him in the future, they were the break in the chain which has led to the events that we see now. Now that he has got five to 600,000 people who are members of the Labour Party, when before that it might have been around, and my figures might be wrong here, around about the couple of hundred thousand mark, right? So if you want to say that, that out of that 200,000, there might have been, say, 10% who were extreme. So you've got something like 180,000 people who were, who were, um, who were logical and, and wanted to follow Labour because they believed in Labour politics. Now you've got potentially 400,000 people who have joined the Labour Party because of Jeremy Corbyn. Now, the thing is, they don't want him to change. They don't want him to change his outlook. They don't want to change the way he behaves. They don't want to be change any of his policies. And this includes this one. They believe that capitalism has to fall 
in the Marxist agenda that's been mentioned uh, by uh, the great Maureen Lippmann. And in order to put that agenda forward, they don't mind if there's this little thing called anti-Semitism because they actually believe it. They are anti-Semites. And the point that Maureen Lippmann made in that short clip, uh, which she kicked it off, was the leader of the Labour Party is an anti-Semite. I was in, obviously, in a, in a wider scheme of things for a relatively short t time. I was a parliamentarian for five years, but I saw Jeremy Corbyn every day. Let me say that I was never a friend of his. And I'll tell you why he wasn't a friend of mine. Because in one of the first speeches that I made in the House of Commons, I got up and supported Israel. And immediately, uh, to take the line from that old film, The Quiet Man, my name was written in his little black book and there was a line put through it. He never once communicated with me. Now I think that is a blessing rather than a curse. <laughs> Absolutely. But nonetheless, <laughs> it demonstrates that this man uh, creates his political uh, allegiances and, he, and, and, and wants his support from people who are other than having any feelings whatsoever for the state of Israel. And that says a lot about him and his, his, his thoughts and his beliefs. And the 500,000 or the 400,000 people who have joined the Labour Party share them. So I don't think it should be Labour politicians in Parliament Square urging people to join the Labour Party, because I, I think that's lost now for a long, long time, because they're now in control of the National Executive Committee, they're now in control of the procedures which select candidates in the future. And the problem is, is that all the sensible Labour MPs are cowering, are cowering in the corner saying, well, what do we do now? There is no plan. That's the really worrying thing for not only British politics, but for this whole issue of anti-Semitism. And um, Sharon, do you, do you think uh, Jeremy Corbyn's uh, mask of deception is beginning to fall off? Uh, we, we, we saw that he handled the, the Russian crisis very badly and now he's not handling this issue to do with anti-Semitism and the, the party's actually fueling it to make it worse. Do you think the uh, British public are now beginning to wake up and see the real Jeremy Corbyn? Um, or what's I, needed to actually see I would the like to Corbyn. hope so, but I'm not so sure that they are, because as Michael said, his supporters are not the run-of-the-mill, sensible sort of person. His supporters are those who've been waiting in the wings to have a say in major government decisions, um, and they will push him. And I think there are enough young people, and, and I, I go back to the young people, there are enough young people to rally around him to create those numbers. Um, and yes, there are the older people who've come back on, on... What people don't know is that this weekend had two demonstrations. There was one on Saturday outside Downing Street. Um, and that was the equivalent of the Land March in Israel. They have it every year in London. And um, we went along. That was our contribution. We went along to see what was going on. We go along every year. Um, and this year we decided that we weren't going to say anything to them about their policies. We weren't going to respond to the accusations about do you, they were asking us, do you agree? Um, are, are you not, do you think that 16 people dead is a, is a catastrophe, 16 Palestinians? Um, so we didn't respond to that. What we did was we walked around asking people, are you Jewish? And the interesting thing was their response. The anti-Semitism that came out of, good God, no, this sort of response was coming out of people and the older generation, might I say. Um, and we have them on film. So it's not, a, it's not a scientific study, but there they are. They were there shouting for Jeremy, who had sent in his speech. He was a coward this year. He didn't come and speak. He's been known to speak at that rally. Um, he sent in a, a script that somebody read for him. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I think he's got enough support of people that we, we discount and we shouldn't discount them. Um, he's issued his... Um, local election uh, campaign. I think it was in the paper this morning. And what's he saying? One of his major issues is talking about the CST. Suddenly he's extolling the virtues of the CST. And suddenly he's saying how terrible it is that Jewish schools have to have security guards. Well, sorry, Jeremy, Jewish schools have always had security guards. I grew up with security guards outside my school. This is not a new phenomenon. Jews have always been under threat and he needs to wake up, and I think the electorate needs to wake up. Jeremy Corbyn cannot lead this country. As I said, not only for Jews, but for everybody. He will destroy this country. And, uh, and Michael, um, down to the last four minutes or so of the programme, um, how should decent uh, members of the uh, Labour Party that uh, you were once part of uh, now respond to this challenge, not only of the issue of anti-Semitism within the party, but also uh, Corbyn's uh, leadership? Well, I think there are still many constituency Labour parties that will be um, 
not minded to support uh, Jeremy Corbyn's beliefs and where he's taken the party. The structure within the Black Labour Party is that they can have their CLP meetings, they can pass resolutions which in turn can condemn the leadership or decisions that are made. So there's, there's those opportunities to take that type of action. I don't, but in other areas where momentum are under control, and the point about that uh, Sharon made a few moments ago about the, the older people coming back into it again, I mean, who would have heard of John Lansman? Who would have known who he was? Now he's a leader of momentum and he's getting f front, left and centre on, on, on programmes when they're discussing Labour Party politics. We've got a, we've got a political movement within another political movement. Right. I mean, they don't even... Trotsky advocated that you should infiltrate other parties. We've actually got another party inside another party, so it's utter madness. I've got, I would like to be optimistic. Uh, and, and my knowledge of Labour Party procedures and the way uh, resolutions, resolutions work and all the rest of it, that's all still there. Uh, but whether or not there is either a will or enough people to translate that into any ch physical change in the Labour Party, uh, to me, uh, I, I, I'm doubtful if that, if that capacity is there. Uh, uh, and Sean, how do we engage the public uh, and engage public opinion uh, to counter the, what we're seeing really is the apathy and the indifference that we're seeing that something like uh, due hatred arising within Her Majesty's opposition in mainstream politics is a very, very dangerous sign for uh, where our society is heading in Britain today? That's really a very difficult uh, question. Um, how do we engage people? Well, uh, most of the country wants to get on with their lives. They're not really that interested in politics. Um, they go along and vote because the, they see the cabin there and they go along and they put their X on a piece of paper. And I think most of them will still, most of the disinterested people will still vote according to party lines. And this is, I think, one of the big dangers because they don't realise that their parties, the Labour Party, is no longer what it used to be. Um, I think if we're going to change things, that those Labour Party politicians, MPs, need to resign. They need to walk out. John Mann, if he wants to be who he says he is, needs to say, I will no longer be part of this process. I am leaving. Luciana Berger, she's been attacked by anti-Semites. She needs to stand up and walk out. It's no good making a noise and then going back in there and having parliamentary meetings chaired by Jeremy Corbyn. You cannot have that. They need to leave. If they had self-respect, they would go. Uh, Sharon and uh, Michael, thank you so much for being my uh, superb guests on uh, Politics Today. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to thank you for watching Politics Today. We can't allow the emergence of uh, Jew hatred to take hold of one of our major political parties without this having a profound impact upon our society. So we all have a duty to stamp this out and don't tolerate the rise of Jew hatred. So thank you for watching Politics Today.